Now, we, we know the Minister has a flight to catch, so um, <laughs> we'll let you go and we'll move on to our next session and our panel, uh, which to understand the role of civil society in social movements and building transform transformative change, I'd like to invite our panel to the stage. And while they're getting seated, I'll, I'll introduce them. Uh, chairing, so come on up, panellists. <laughs> uh, chairing the panel this afternoon is Sarah Madison, Associate Professor in the School of Political, uh, Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne, where she's also the Assistant Dean for Research in the Faculty of Arts. Sarah's areas of research expertise include reconciliation, uh, conflict, uh, transformation, Indigenous political culture and social movements. So welcome, Sarah. I'll get you to put your hand up as you're uh, uh, sitting down. Uh, joining Sarah on the pa panel is Isaac Estill. Isaac, who's an environmental campaigner working on the Stop Adani campaign, uh, which, as we know, is uh, the large proposed coal mine development in Queensland. Victoria Mackenzie McCarg, who is chair of the Climate Action Network Australia, CANA, and who has led campaigns for government action on climate change and sustainable transport for the past 10 years. The Reverend Tim Costello, who needs no introduction to this audience, uh, is one of the, uh, Australia's best known uh, community leaders, chief advocate at World Vision Australia, and also uh, co-chair of the Campaign for Australian Aid. And Jared McKenna, founder of Love Makes A Way campaign, which seeks an end to Australia's inhumane asylum seeker policies and is a subscriber to the wacky idea that Christianity should look like Jesus. So without further ado, over to you, Sarah, to get us underway. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, uh, and, and thanks, panellists. Before I begin, I would just like to uh, remind everyone that we are meeting this afternoon on Aboriginal land. Uh, always was, always will be. We are today on the unceded territories of the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nations, uh, and I know, speaking for my own organisation, I'm going to generalise to all of yours, there's more we can all do to engage in a more lawful and ethical relation, uh, set of relations with those nations. So this is a great privilege for me as someone who has been active in and has researched social movements for, for many years. Uh, the longer I've been a political scientist, the less I have been interested in what governments do and the more <laughs> I am interested in what activists do. I firmly believe that the only way the world changes is when people come together and demand that it does. So here on the stage we have four uh, um, amazing examples of the kinds of activists who are making change happen uh, in, in, this, in this country, in this region and indeed internationally. So I'm going to start this afternoon by asking each of my panellists to just tell us a little bit about your cause um, and why you built a social movement. You've all been actively involved in, in building things, not just joining in. So um, I might start with you, Isaac. Sure. This one? Yep. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name's Isaac. Uh, so I'm a campaigner with the Stofadani campaign. Uh, I think, you know, I'll go into a little bit more detail about the campaign, some of the things the campaign's been doing, some of my own opinions on social movement theory as the panel unfolds. But I think for the time being, the most interesting thing about the Sofadani campaign is that in its current iteration, it really only started seven months ago, hmm. in late March. Uh, and since then, it's seen about 160 local groups adopt and run the campaign. Uh, it's seen almost 700 to 1,000 uh, local leaders across Australia actually implementing that campaign. Thousands of people being turned out at our summits, roadshow events, film screenings, uh, actions, uh, civil disobedient actions, rallies, the list goes on and on. In fact, uh, since the campaign launched in March, uh, there's been 725 actions that we know of, which works out to an average of about four a day. So one every six hours, even while you're sleeping. Uh, so you know, it's an incredibly active campaign with a lot of energy, a lot of ambition and some massive wins under its belt. And it's really only been around for seven months and it's a huge testament to what happens when a uh, clear goal is carved out and when a whole bunch of organisations are willing to work together uh, towards a shared goal. So uh, I might talk a little bit more about it as the panel unfolds. Thanks. Terrific. Tim, we might go straight to you. Sure. Well, I, um, 
I'm a failed activist. Um, <laughs> my kids, uh, who are now grown up, said to me over dinner, Dad, is there any campaign you've backed that's ever won? Um, what they had in mind, I guess, was uh, 25 years ago, I started fighting, uh, well, Crown Casino and the pokies industry. Australia has 20% of the world's pokies, and we still have 20% of the world's pokies. And uh, that sense of uh, the power of that lobby with their political donations, with a predatory product, a shift, I've likened to the NRA and its power uh, and haven't made a lot of uh, gains. On um, some other campaigns, to be a bit more charitable to myself, there's been a, some success. Um, I was the uh, mayor of St Kilda running on a public housing uh, platform. I did such a good job as the mayor of St Kilda, they abolished the whole council. Uh, I'm the last <laughs> mayor ever of St Kilda. But, that campaign did work. Um, St Kilda has 12% of its housing stock that's uh, social housing. Australia's average is 5%. Britain, European countries are 30%. Why do we have so many homeless in Australia? Because we haven't invested in social housing, at least in St Kilda. That campaign got some traction. Look, um, the thing I might talk about later, which is really uh, a movement within a movement is I see myself as a bridge person between faith and justice or spirituality and justice, uh, which I think is the connection that goes to meaning and an energy zone. Uh, when you realise in international development 84% of the world's population have a religious faith and it's growing, when you know that Africans, 74% trust their faith leaders way beyond any other leaders um, when people like Jim King of the World Bank says we can't beat poverty without engaging faith. Um, that's an area of activism that uh, I'm very focused on with the full recognition that often faith leaders seem to be on the wrong side of the issues. <laughs> but uh, that stream from Desmond Tutu and Mandela and Martin Luther King and going back William Wilberforce actually is also the side of the faith connection, particularly given the dem demographics of faith. Uh, and I just say for, for this audience, because it's probably not realised, that Australia is quite secular, about 8 10% church going. Curiously, in terms of faith structures, 23 of the biggest 25 charities in Australia are faith-based. In America, very religious, only 10 of the 25 biggest charities in America are faith-based. In Britain, only three of the biggest 25 are faith-based. So we have this strange disconnect between secular and often the heavy lifting. Well, we will come back to the question of um, the, the role of faith in, in social movements, but I'll, we'll just, and I want to come back to your, the, the issue you raised about failing as well. I, I think that's a really interesting question. So we might jump now to Victoria. What's your cause? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so I've been working within the climate movement uh, for the last 10 to 12 years um, through state-based and national advocacy organisations running lots of uh, community-driven climate change campaigns and working particularly strongly in coalitions and alliances. Um, but it's particularly CANA and the work of CANA that I wanted to touch on here today. Um, we are the closest thing that the environment movement has to a peak body, um, but we are not a peak body. We are very determined not to be one. Uh, and we, so we're set up a little bit different as a sort of a sector to other, to other sectors that we work very closely with and, and in coalition with. But we had a really major crisis point uh, about two and a half years ago because we fundamentally weren't acting as a social movement. And the question you've asked is how do we build, go about building a social movement? I think the problem is we didn't actually take it on as a task of building it. I think we sat back and thought this is an evolutionary process and that we will exist as a beautiful ecosystem and isn't it lovely how democratic we are that you know people and, and non-hierarchical we are and, and you can sort of grow through this movement. 
but that wasn't, we weren't moving. <laughs> we were social, but we weren't moving. And if we want to be able to create impactful change, we had to really fundamentally change our attitude to being a social movement, um, to deal with our own internal tragedy of the commons. No one was taking responsibility for us as a movement. And to start addressing really key questions internally of leadership and how do we support that in, in a disparate and diverse social movement. Thank you. And Jared, what's your cause? Well, I'd probably need to start by apologising first to the organisers for not providing a bio, which meant that uh, they went searching for one and found Tom ba Ballard's. And so I, I would never describe myself as the uh, founder of Love Makes Away. Uh, I happened to be there at the start with a bunch of other people. And uh, sadly and often typically, it's uh, a white guy like me that gets the attention instead of the countless um, uh, female leaders in the church that were also there from the start, including people of color. So I want to acknowledge that uh, right from the start. Um, but since you got me anyway, um, Love Makes Away has uh, become one of Australia's largest faith-based nonviolent direct action movements in history. We've seen over 300 faith leaders risk arrest to see children released from detention. And I guess if I played any role at all, it was uh, as a connector between some of my mentors, including uh, Uncle Vincent Harding, who was next door neighbor and close uh, friend of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., as well as uh, um, people, as well as Vincent Harding, of people like Reverend Jim Lawson, who Dr. King called the greatest tacticianer and strategist of the freedom movement, commonly known to us as the civil rights movement. And connecting leaders in Australia to that great tradition and uh, history of nonviolent social change, where we've been able to liberate the church from agendas that look nothing like that of Jesus's and something that looks a little bit more like, where instead of this um, obsessive fixation on what happens between the bed sheets, a real concern about what's happening on our streets, particularly to those who society considers lost and last, the least, the left out and looked over. And uh, that's seen nowhere so clearly as how we treat the First Nations in this nation and how we treat um, the most recently arrived. So part of Love Makes Away's work in a very explicit sense for those of us who are involved is undoing the shadow of white Australia policy, that first law that was passed by our parliament in 1901, which continu continues to be cast over how Australia's default settings seem to be white, this strange construct which others, others continually. So that's part of our work. We actually might stay on that question for a minute because I'm, I'm quite conscious that we're a, a we're both a, a male-heavy panel and, and, and a very white panel. Um, and one of the things that we want to explore in this session is, is the idea of standing in solidarity and, and what that means uh, for movements that are working globally or regionally. Um, how, do we, how, do, how do any of you decentre those kinds of um, dominant ways of organising that do tend to centre white men? How do you, how do you decentre whiteness? How do you decentre masculinity? I know um, there are, as you say, amazing women, uh, many, many people of colour leading in this, mm. this space, but often they're not the ones who get the limelight or who, who's, uh, whose activism is really acknowledged. Mm. Let's go to you, Victoria. I think it's a really tough question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going out on a limb and saying I think the climate movement has been a little bit, we've, we've handled um, sort of uh, including women into positions of leadership much better in the last couple of years. I don't think we're there yet in terms of bringing um, communities of, of people of colour um, into our movement and, and broadening the movement as well as we could. And we have, the environment movement has a really long history um, of association with indigenous communities. Uh, but it's something that is picked up and dropped a lot. And that's, there's a really interesting tension in, in, in mm. what's happening there. Um, I might touch on that in, in just a moment. On the former issue, um, when I first started in the movement, I was hired as a climate campaigner. Uh, I was one of the very few climate campaigners, despite the fact that the environment movement is over 80% um, female. 
they're typically not or they weren't in campaign roles because it's a very public facing role. It is often seen in a leadership role. It's often seen as a quite aggressive role. It's not a term I'd like to use, but that's how it's often seen. And, um, and there's some barriers in terms of the way, I think that's a challenge in the way we do our advocacy and our campaigning if what's presented is not actually attracting or allowing women into those spaces. That's something we've been really challenging. But another aspect of that that I think has been really crucial is actually discussing this with our funders. Because we've looked mm. at what are the sorts of leadership, we, we need to completely change the game on climate change. We need to go faster and further than we've ever been before. <laughs> and so we need some very different types of activism and leadership. And when we look at what that looks like, in particular for us, it looks like collaboration. And we need to be operating in a much more collaborative way. We do see, and I hesitate to generalise, but I'll go for it here, we do see a lot of female leadership um, in the collaborative space and a really strong skill set there, yet we weren't seeing funders put money into that because their um, needs were to be able to show a certain number of media hits, the person I fund, I want that CEO on the front page on their campaign, I want them to be able to claim their campaign win. There was a real tension in that, it wasn't supporting the long-term collaborative effort and that's something we've really focused on. Okay. I might just jump over to, to, to Isaac actually to, to pick up on some of those questions of, of collaboration and solidarity because I know that the Stop Adani campaign has quite explicitly tried to, to build coalitions across, um, across a range of, of differences in both culture and experience but also organisations. So can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, Adani was not a household name uh, and, you know, isn't maybe quite a household name in Australia yet, and it certainly wasn't at the beginning of the year, but obviously in India, uh, Adani is a household name. You know, he is one of the uh, richest people in the country. In fact, Gautam Adani himself uh, is actually wealthier than any person in Australia, a very wealthy individual, uh, and so, and has a shameful track record of human rights abuses and environmental abuses, corruption, uh, you name it, uh, Adani, the company, uh, has had a crack at it in India. And, um, and as a consequence of that, you know, starting a campaign about Adani in Australia suddenly meant that there's been this uh, huge opportunity to speak with people in India who have gotten in touch with us who have said, oh, you know, you're dealing with Adani. Well, you know, welcome to the club. Um, and so, you know, at the beginning of this year as part of the Stop Adani Roadshow, which was one of the sort of big events that toured the country uh, and really got the Stop Adani campaign moving in Australia, um, you know, we're very lucky to have Vashali Patil, who is a uh, sort of an environment as well as a human rights campaigner in very poor sections of India, uh, who has done a lot of work with indigenous Indian uh, fishing people um, along coastlines that Adani has effectively just decimated and uh, completely destroyed traditional ways of life, uh, completely destroyed um, a lot of traditional practices and the food and, uh, and networks and communities that go along with it. Uh, and so, you know, it's been, uh, that, that was really the beginning of it and since then it's just grown and grown. I, I'd be interested to know, did anyone here see or at least hear some of the excerpts from the Four Corners piece that was about the Adani coal mine? Yeah. I've seen a couple of nods in the room. Um, yeah, it was an incredible expose, almost entirely about uh, the corruption, human rights abuses and environment abuses of the Adani company in India and really only touched very briefly on what they're proposing right here in Australia. And um, I think uh, maybe the most upsetting thing about it is that whilst our movement is trying to build those ties as much as we possibly can, obviously we have both major parties in Australia uh, turning a complete blind eye uh, to those abuses. And I think for me personally, most upsettingly, um, is that there have been very clear abuses of worker rights. Uh, workers in uh, uh, coal ports, in particular coal ports over in India, have been you know, crushed to death by Australian coal. You know, our coal has killed workers overseas and we haven't seen Australia's Workers' Party, the Labor Party, uh, condone that behaviour, condone that company and are still just letting them pass under the radar right here in Australia. So, you know, I think there's still a lot of work to do to take those stories here to Australia and say if we're going to have true solidarity and we're going to see Australians act in true solidarity with a company that we not only want operating here, but that needs to, uh, you know, clean up its act or stop operating altogether over in India, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Thanks. Um, 
Well, I might come back to, to you, Jared. So, so riffing off this, uh, this uh, Isaac's introduced the idea of telling stories, how important it is that, that the media is reporting, but also that movements and organisations are telling stories about what it is that you're trying to achieve or an alternative vision that you might see for the world, which invites the question um, of, of, of what it is that you're trying to, to win. I think so. So Tim introduced this, this idea from his um, incredibly supportive children that uh, he's a failure. <laughs> but we hear this a lot about social movements that they don't they don't win anything. They don't achieve anything. If we look at any of the issues that any of us care about, you could possibly make an argument that in fact, despite decades of activism, we've all gone backwards, and yet we keep going because we believe that there is change to be had through these processes. So I think it invites us to think a little bit more broadly about what it is we're trying to win. Mm -hmm. Is it just a policy change or are we speaking to people's hearts and minds in a different kind of transformative way? Can you maybe reflect on that for Love Makes A Way? Yeah, sure. Um, of course, children in detention wasn't Love Makes A Way's only concern. The concern is we have people in detention, period. We're treating people who desperately need safety, literally asylum, as prisoners who have done nothing wrong. So uh, with my mentors in mind, it was the biggest issue in Montgomery wasn't buses and the fact that African-Americans couldn't sit at the front of the bus, but it was what was winnable. Or the issue in Nashville wasn't uh, lunch counters. That wasn't the biggest issue. It's that lunch counters were winnable. And so realizing that for Australia to actually undergo a new kind of imagination where we realize that refugees are people just like you and me, only they need safety that what will that will take is finding something that is winnable, what um, Jim Lawson would call the levers of power, and putting the focus and the energy on that. And so us detaining children indefinitely, which was going on, that we determined was one of the most winnable places where we can start to unveil and reveal what actually is happening all the time. And because it's the water that we're swimming in, we don't know that we're wet. And so it's finding those specific things and then connecting that to a larger vision, a larger vision of who we can be. And one of the things that um, Uncle Vincent Harding would always say to me is, Jared, that the work you're doing for, in the US they frame it around immigration reform, that this isn't a different movement to the freedom movement. And it's why when you spend time with freedom movement leaders, they won't call it the civil rights movement. They say that's the language that the journalists labelled our movement and it's too small. It doesn't have a vision for all of society of how we can transform our world and actually have a different understanding of even power and how we understand what power we're trying to work towards, a nonviolent power and a nonviolent vision of future for dignity of all. So it's finding those things that are winnable, connecting them to the vision of a, a different, and then plotting for people, here's the next step for you to do, here's the training that you can come to, here's what we're working for. And Dani have been a brilliant example of this and why I've been so pleased to take part in a number of actions is because this is a movement that has the kind of energy where it's gone from momentum to movement building that we're about to see the kind of win despite what we're up against and that's incredibly exciting. Tim, that's one uh, vision of, 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 of what the aim is, what the goal is, what winning might look like. Does that match up with your vision? Uh, yeah, look, I, we, we're always caught between the end and the next step of the means and does that compromise the end and how does it take us on that journey? Um, you know, we've been having the debate internally, having just come back from the uh, Bangladesh camps with Rohingya, knowing that there are Rohingya on Manus, now at risk, stateless, who can't go back, do we make a specific call given the government's saying you know, this is terrible what's happening, we put 30 million in, to actually say those Rohingya and Manus should be given citizenship straight away, which runs against the end of saying now all refugees in a non-discriminatory way should actually have the same claim. Is it a, a mean step that undercuts your general end or is it winnable? Is it a step you take to, to, to go further? Mm. And, you know, I think um, when you go back to the earlier question about um, uh, what we're trying to do, why it's always difficult is so often in the public mind, in our sector, it's giving to some things called hardware. It's uh, the well, the school, the health clinic. What we're actually trying to do 
and we heard this brilliantly from our Nepalese speaker this morning, is we're trying to change the software. Yep. It's the software of men's attitudes toward women. Mm. It's the, and it's got to be in relationship and it takes time and it's not going to be achievable often for generations, although we heard a fantastic story of achievement this morning. But it's set in culture, it's set in behaviour, whether it's attitudes to women or to other tribes or to caste, this software and culture. Uh, really is an end that is a long way off. Mm. Mm. And you have to make a whole lot of often tactical choices on the way. I think that's a really important point. I think for most of us, the struggles that we're engaged in are multi-generational. Yeah. And we understand that we can certainly look, look behind us and, and see the generations that have gone before us and struggled in these spaces. And we can anticipate the generations that might come. In climate, Victoria, I'm not convinced we have generations. What does, what does this kind of global crisis that, that uh, seems to be approaching with, with great speed mean for the types of activism you might engage in? And, and, and particularly in the case of Kano, why has it led to this particular focus on coalition building? I mean, it's, it's a really difficult question because you're right, Sorry, we don't I keep have... Sorry, no, the difficult no, no, questions. No, it's, it's, it's one that's so present in the minds of so many people and it in itself, this urgency in itself is creating problems mm -hmm. for us as a movement. The urgency is very real uh, and the science is particularly non-negotiable. <laughs> and uh, there, are, there are sites that are very precious to people, there are communities, there are whole nation states that do not have a future, mm. potentially at all, or certainly not in any way that is recognisable, that will absolutely be occurring within our lifetimes, that is occurring now. That's creating a level of fear that is, uh, needs to be managed, but it's also um, not always healthy or helpful. And that is translating at times into um, urgency, which looks more like chaos in decision making. And so there's a tension here that we have to hold between what is urgent right now and needs to happen and what we need to build for the long term. And that we don't just give up because the reef will go and because series of nations will go and because bushfires will be out of control, we have to actually think of ourselves not just as agents to stop the worst of climate change, but also of agents of transition and resilience. And changing that concept of our role as advocates is actually what we're sort of in the process of doing at the moment. And that's, that's pretty hard because there's slightly different skill sets and there are different ways of conceiving of change and power and where power originates and comes from and, and it's um, it's a really tough job and you know love some more minds thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's stay with this question of power because it is one that bedevils social movements. Power uh, as I'm sure most of you in this room have encountered at some stage in your lives is very seductive mm. and one of the mistakes I would say I've seen movements and activist organisations make is to be seduced by power, mm -hmm. to find themselves close to government, feeling that they have uh, the ear of someone powerful and to start subtly moderating messages, pulling their punches, treading a bit more carefully. And you, yeah, I think you can map this in a range of social movements where their, their impact, their power their, ha, has declined because, of course, their power doesn't come from inside, it comes from, from outside. Stop Adani is, is pretty much a, an outsider movement, <laughs> Isaac, I, w I would say. How do you, how do you navigate that within, within your organisations? Yeah, I uh, don't think, yeah, we're, we're pretty outside the tent at the moment, uh, that's for sure. Uh, and I don't think we'll be let inside the tent for some so time So where does to your come. power come from? Uh, it's, I mean, it's a common story that's told in the environment movement about the Franklin. You know, the mm -hmm. Franklin Dam blockade uh, is considered this sort of, you know, it's the story for the environment movement in Australia, you know, and, uh, and uh, increasingly with Stoppadani, words like, you know, more uh, frankly uh, you know, are being thrown around as uh, ways that we need to, you know, Franklin things up a little bit around here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a, there is another side of the Franklin story that is not told as often, which is that large environment organisations uh, managed to build a movement that was so big yep. that they got uh, the powers that be to go, oh my goodness, there are votes at stake here and this is really terrible and I'm just kind of sick of it. Let's do what these people say. 
And then those people, uh, the environment movement, got really comfortable in the halls of power, really comfortable in the, in the halls of parliament. And, uh, and they did. They started pulling their punches. They started not going as hard, you know. Um, and, and I think that really, in some ways, this is one of the first times that the environment movement, or at least the climate movement, what's well, the first time for the climate movement, uh, is sort of getting uh, a bit over that, a bit over pulling the punches, you know. Half the Great Barrier Reef irreversibly bleeds to death. Mm. Irreversibly. Like, mm. It's not coming back from my generation, my kids' generation, their kids' generation. It's just dead. You know, and I think that for a lot of environment uh, organisations, that's the point where it's like, well, maybe asking nicely is just not working anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think for the Stop Adani movement, power takes two forms uh, that we're seeing more and more. The first is just being uh, everywhere and being a complete nuisance, uh, and that is so important. You know, we're in day four of the Queensland election trail, and so far, every single day, our premier has been, uh, you know, accosted by a Stop Adani protester, either on camera or uh, and some incredibly articulate tourism operators explaining to yeah. first the Premier and then later both the Premier's security guards and a nearby media camera uh, some of the issues at play. So just being constantly in, in the space, being a pain, growing that thorn in the side. Um, and then the second way is just in sheer scale. Because, you know, as we were talking about before, you know, the currency of movements is, uh, is you know, hearts and minds, it's imagination, it's mm. hope. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, uh, yeah, there's sure that's that annoying aspect of it, but the other side is that for Stop Adani to win, we actually just need to get to a scale where we can achieve what is currently considered impossible. Yeah. Um, we're not gonna win the campaign to stop the biggest coal mine in the Southern Hemisphere uh, with the current political landscape. Yep. There's no options, there's no, there's no strategic throughput, there's no surgical intervention we can make to win. We're just gonna have to create a social movement that is so big and it's gonna be a very blunt tool and a lot of people are gonna get caught in the way and that's not our fault, that's their fault um, to actually upend politics as we know it at the moment and, uh, and just see what happens. I don't think really anyone knows what's going to happen as we, as we move forward. New cracks will open up, new opportunities mm. will open up, and we'll see that. We'll get there when we get there. But, uh, yeah. Tim, Tim, this... <laughs> I, I love the idea of the uh, hope as a currency. Mm. Uh, Tim, I'm sure you'd agree with some of that, but also I suspect your style of politics has been a little different to Adani over the years. Where, where do you situate yourself? How do you understand the work that you've been doing in terms of that relationship to, to institutional power? Yeah, so uh, I just got old. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my style of politics uh, certainly was more like that at your age. You look about 15. Um, <laughs> um, I, I remember in 1995, I called for safe injecting rooms in Melbourne, got utterly beat up by Premier Jeff Kennett, who loved beating me up, and now in 2017, we've just announced a trial of safe injecting rooms. Go home and tell, you, tell your kids you are a winner. Well, yeah, <laughs> indeed. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I've certainly been often out there and, uh, you know, Kenneth and I exchanged a lot of love messages in the media at the time and he called me un-Australian and troublesome and so I've been on sort of the Adani receiving end. Um, I think the, the key, and, you know, I put this in biblical language which uses uh, the word prophet, and mm. a prophet needs proximity to power yeah. without being in the pocket of power. Amen. And I think you do need both. Um, I think in our sector, where it feels, notwithstanding what the minister has just said, we've only gone backwards, um, you actually think about what happened in Great Britain, where there was the Make Poverty History rallies. You remember our wind in our sail, we're doing well, we've got it energy, we've got only five years ago, bipartisan commitment to 0 0.5, now there's barely a politician on either side that ever rem even remembers their own promise of where we were to go. And you go, so what was different in Britain? They did much of the same things as us. They had, you know, the Make Poverty History concerts and all of that. They had this proximity to power that also had a bit of luck. The luck was 
David Cameron to throw off the nasty, part, uh, nasty party conservative tag needed two issues to show they weren't nasty. One was gay marriage and the second was saying and we're going to legislate 0.7 see we care for the poor. And they needed to make poverty history and the rallies to say and there's a bit of public support, there wasn't ever that much, there's never any public support for aid. I know we always hear we've got to get, get, get it up. I've never seen any country where there's public support for aid because you go, yeah, yeah, it's up there. But as soon as it's your own electricity prices going up or homelessness, it just dissipates. That's mm. the way it always is. Mm. It needs leaders with convictions, with a bit of pu uh, public cover that their Make Poverty History movement had to actually get that legislation through. And you need a bit of luck going. So um, I don't think my politics necessarily is different, but I do think you need proximity without co-option. One of the other issues that I think that raised, and I might come to, to you, Jared, is, is these types of changes that, that you've just talked about that uh, rely on a bit of luck in some circumstances, we can also see might not necessarily be durable if we haven't also uh, won the hearts and minds that we can, we might get a win over the line, but then uh, there's a change of government and it slowly or rapidly is, yeah. is undone. So, so how do you, how do you work to embed the kind of values changes in the, in the hearts and minds of people? What are the, what are the tactics and strategies that you use to really engage with, with people's core values in a way that aren't going to be easily tipped over by yeah. a change in the political luck? Yeah, yeah. And, and before uh, talking about Bill Moyer and his theory of, of change, um, I think Tim is actually a great example of someone who's not only had a proximity to politics with a capital P, but to pain. And uh, I think in terms of my own journey, I don't feel like I've ever led in the asylum seeker space. I've followed my friends who are asylum seekers. Before Love Makes A Way opened up, I'd spent a decade of literally in my own home welcoming friends who had been detained by my country. And it's that proximity to pain where that means that we're still in conversation with politics, but we're not co-opted which actually goes to the theory of change. If we can stay in the places, the neighbourhoods, um, in the field, as many people in this room would often talk about it, and realise that power actually resides there. So Martin Luther King's first ever question to Jim Lawson, who ran the first workshop on nonviolent social change that Martin Luther King ever attended, was, what about power? And Jim Lawson's response to him is, nonviolence is the greatest power we have available to us. And when we're stuck in a paradigm where we think that those at the top of the pyramid have all the power, we actually give away the power of social movements and mobilisation. So even um, like Saul Alinsky's response would be that whether it's unions or faith uh, communities, be they mosques, churches or synagogues or temples, that uh, all these communities have a, uh, a thickness in the sociological sense, uh, a depth there, that, and particularly like... Um, knowing the source material for, for Christians and Jews, it's, it's on our side. So if we can actually enter into those places that um, we can use that material to form a new imagination, to call people to a larger vision, and then realise that it's not simply about the change agents that hold the vision, or the reformers that will then turn uh, what is a vision into legislation that actually make sure that... Um, uh, that which is achieved, those successes become law, that we actually need in our movements and need to build into our movements, the rebels. And one of my challenges for, for us in this sector is what space are we making for the rebels? Because in terms of Bill Moyer's theories, at stage four takeoff, it only happens if there are rebels. What's happening with the Stop Adani campaign is because it's a movement on the margins that is in conversation with the centre in such way that they welcome rebels. Real social movements must have rebels as a part of it. And one of the things that with our proximity to those in politics that we often first cut off is those who would actually turn it into a more realised movement, true movement, not merely a, a campaign. And so I think that's some of the area that we need to push into and realise that as well as social change being an art, there's also a science to it. And we've got to be better skilled and schooled in the science of social change and the theory. 
Absolutely. One of the one of the theoretical challenges that has has plagued social movement theorists and and people studying social movements is, um, is is related to these questions in quite an important way. There's a lot of pressure on movements uh, to to represent themselves, to appear as though they are unified, as though they are all speaking from the the same place, that they're on the same page. Uh, there was one theorist in, a, in in the U.S. who actually came up with an acronym: WUNK. Movements had to have WUNK, which was worthiness, unities, uh, and and unity was the the U and and numbers and continuity. So unity is kind of at the centre of what movements are meant to do. But of course, any of us who have been involved in a movement know that that's not the case. Personally, I think that's a wonderful thing. I'm of the view that if uh, social movement activists stop disagreeing with one another, we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, but it, it can be a political problem. And I know, to come to another hard question for you, Victoria, this is the, at the very reason that CANA exists, is to try and coordinate more unity across what was sometimes a very divided and fractious sector. Can you just reflect a little bit on how you manage that tension between the kind of creativity that can come out of disunity and the political demand for, for a unified response? I think the first thing is knowing that that's what we want to do. Yeah. Uh, because I think we at times oscillate between the two. And, and we, I've noticed we, we do this still. Um, we go from moments of thinking, no, we absolutely need unity, everyone in the tent, to then getting really comfortable with the idea that that's never going to happen. So let's just look at how we hold these tensions and manage uh, manage that. And sometimes it's managing conflict. That's like it, it's at a very at a very pointy end of conflict within within a movement, and that's okay as well. These are realities, and it's the contest of ideas and the way of change. And when we're looking at something as enormous and comprehensive as climate change, uh, there's going to be lots of different parts ways through this that we can't yet imagine. So, um, I, and I feel like when we struggle, we, we need to look, in, in balancing that, we need to look more closely at what we're really struggling with each time it emerges. Mm -hmm. And often, I think it is fear of failure because mm -hmm. it's a, usually a moment where there is a campaign that we care very deeply about, that we think is ultimately very important. and. For, from whichever perspective you've come to this, you can see a pathway. <laughs> and if you can see it, you're bound to think you're right. <laughs> and let's go for it. And anything that gets in the way can very rapidly become wrong. And it's not necessarily that you've um, got a, a real uh, objection to rebels per se, or objection to reformers, uh, but that you can see a path and you don't want anything in the way. So it's in some ways I think building strategic skills yeah. in, our, in our movements is really important so that we're able to understand the breadth of strategies that are required to take to create change. Can you say a little bit more about that? What kind of strategic skills are you talking about? Well, there is, I mean, there, there's very clear inside politics strategies. Mm. And people who think about inside politics are thinking very much either, and even within that field, you've got people who are deeply relational and seeing who, who knows what and knows how to do things. But then other people who are, who are looking very much at the the parliamentary rules, how can I hold something up through the Senate for the next three months? Uh, you know, these are, these are really different um, strategies and tactics and they achieve different ends. Um, someone might look at that who's a community organiser and say, but it builds no community power. That's just ridiculous. Um, why would we be doing that? And so how can we collectively recognise the breadth of strategies that are involved in creating change, the different ways we, um, we create definitions of power, because we have very def different definitions of power. Are we talking about formal or informal power? Are we talking about communities that don't have any? And I would argue there is no such thing as a community or a person who does not have power, but they might not be in touch with it or be choosing to use it uh, as, as yet. Um, and, and how do we want to engage in that? And are we talking about power over something yeah. or power with others? And these are really important um, concepts for us to, to think about as we create these sorts of strategies to go through. I'll just, um, I want to just pick up on something and, and I'm mm. going to contradict you on something, Isaac, so I hope... <laughs> I conflict hope this, um, on the panel. <laughs> here we are, yeah. Yeah, in this. It comes to the question of, I guess, understanding our understanding of strategy as a, as a whole movement and the tensions that we're holding between inside, outside, short-term, long-term, um, a campaign for a specific win versus a campaign for building a movement. All are embedded 
in the history of the Adani campaign. Mm. And Isaac has mentioned a couple of times that the campaign in its current form has been going for seven months. And in its current form is the key mm. there because that campaign has been going for seven years. And that's been seven years of relationship building, yes. of really intense conflict, of really intense um, strategizing, of thinking inside, outside, analyzing power, and building the base and the complexity and the relationships that's of right. key people yep. who could then at the right moment go, let's go. And seven months is phenomenal for that turnaround to have occurred, but it's on the back of a lot of other work. Yeah. It's a very important point. Tim, I want to come back to you in talking about, about unity. Uh, I, I know that you've got more to say on the role of faith in, in social movements. Faith can be a source of unity. It can also be a source of great disunity. How do you see uh, the role of faith in the social movements that you've been involved in? Yeah, so, um, just, just to um, uh, clarify what, what you were saying, I think the inside-outside strategy uh, is quite critical and relates to faith. We, we uh, don't need a unity of being on the same page. We need a unity of what the end is. Mm. We need provos outside who are kicking the cracks open. That cr those cracks provide opportunities for those inside to actually find the space to do something they wouldn't otherwise do. I think yeah. that, but the unity isn't in methodology, it's in end, that, that's there. So within, look, within faith, and I should say that um, even though World Vision is a Christian humanitarian organisation, we have a bigger footprint in Muslim countries and more Muslim employees than most Muslim organisations teaching uh, imams in Afghanistan how to read the Quran, uh, Channels of Hope program, to protect women and children. It, literally lifting out those parts of their source of authority, their plausibility structure, to say, this is what you revere. That often gets us into trouble with some of our more conservative Christian donors. <laughs> we go, hang on, what do you mean? It's the Bible, not the Quran. So you are always saying, really in faith, your heart is well ahead of your head. <laughs> the head often wants to cross the T's, dot the I's, it wants the dogma, the doctrine in place. Mm. Whereas the heart is saying actually, in theological language, where is the spirit? Where is the energy? Where is the hope going to be? And within faith movements, it's always that dialectic. Uh, mm. that's, that's always the debate going on. And you try and maintain a unity of end. In Christian theology, it's this idea of the reign of God mm. on earth, uh, which means neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, this idea that we are all made in the image of God. That was the dominant idea up to 1789 when all societies were religious. 1789 was the first secular government ever in the world with the French. And too many, I think, uh, in human rights movements say it's all the enlightenment that have brought human rights. Well, actually, well up to then, that dynamic saying freedom of conscience, think reformation, was already saying actually uh, we are rejecting the doctrine or the dogma or the unity that's imposed. We are saying humans have rights, they have a freedom of conscience. They, so we start to see and still are seeing this within Islam, uh, you know the Sunni Shia battles in some ways were the Catholic Protestant battles of the 1950s. I know a bit about that because my father was Catholic and my mother Presbyterian. <laughs> and uh, you, you actually always see this difference and fear until you can find that sense of unity. Uh, ah, we actually believe that the end is the same. That's, that's, the, that's the, the faith journey. Jared, I'm of course going to come to you on this, this question as well. So, so maybe you can help a, a poor heathen like me, <laughs> raised by two radical atheists, to be a radical atheist, to understand what engaging through faith and engaging through Christianity in, in, in the case of Love Makes a Way mm. brings to your activism that, that a secular base doesn't. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's an indictment on the church that uh, often the atheists that we get 
um, have become as boring as the church. Uh, while the Simon <laughs> Critchleys, the, the Freuds, uh, the, the Marx, the Nietzsche's, um, that was a, an atheism worthy of our attention, while the thinly veiled uh, neoliberal agendas of the Ditchkins, as um, yeah. Terry Eagleton likes to refer to the new atheists, uh, don't drag us into a, a bigger vision. And uh, Helen and I were talking a little earlier about um, something that she remembers when we were together a couple of years ago, and she was, is it okay for me to share this? But um, she was talking about the personal effect, watching uh, young people who were young Christian leaders and Muslim leaders sing songs from the freedom movement that Uncle Vincent told me. And uh, uh, Helen saying, like, uh, uh, as someone who also doesn't identify as a believer, how much um, uh, hope that that actually produced. And I think we need rituals that move um, uh, our Cartesian uh, fixation on ideas into emotional realities where we can affirm that reality is good and we have a vision that links us together, whether it be through song or dance or ritual, that um, means that our actions in these movements that are so important are penultimate. As in, I can risk wasting my life in this liberating love, knowing that we might not win because there is a vision that's greater than myself and where it doesn't depend on me. And the Talmud puts it like this, to, to paraphrase and hopefully not butcher the Talmud, that don't let the grief of the world move you into despair. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. It is, you have no way that you can give up on this work because it's, it's not merely about you. Um, but, but nor can you stop hoping for that world that, that we long for. And so um, regardless of whether we identify with a particular tradition, um, we do need a vision. And uh, some of the things um, that we can learn from each other is that ability to, to work together and work into what Dr. King would call the beloved community. How do we hold up visions that are greater than um, Fukuyama's end of history and this neoliberal reality that says at the end of the day we are consumers and there is no deeper identity to that. Uh, for, for me, that's the part of the work and uh, that's where listening to the wisdom of um, people like Lilla Watson articulating the wisdom of her mob from up north of here saying, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because you realise that your liberation is tied up in mine, well then we can work together. That's a different worldview. We don't need white saviours. I already have a saviour. I'm a Christian. And uh, he's a brown fella from the Middle East. So um, it's, it's undoing those kind of... Um, Christianity has an incredible tradition of liberating nonviolent love. And yet it is also a history of collusion with empire and violent oppression. And my job as a Christian is to confess the ways that I've been formed by systems that crucify. And as I confess that, try and follow the crucified one who points us to a future that is as beautiful as what we see the love in his life. It's, uh, it's, it's heartwarming to hear activists from a range of perspectives talk so openly about the need for love and for hope in the work that that you all do, uh, and I think it's, it's sustaining, obviously for each of you, but I think it's more importantly, it's sustaining for the, the movements that you are trying to advance, often in the face of incredible opposition. On that note, I'm gonna come back to, to Isaac, and I wanna hear about this from, from all of you. You've all made choices. Uh, we've just heard from, from Jared a bit about what's, what's been part of his driver, but you've all made choices to come to activism, to become activists, to, um, to, to work in social movements. What do you think it is that you have achieved as, uh, as social movements or within social movements that you couldn't have achieved um, in, in any other way? Um, well, just actually very quickly, I really want to... Um, uh, it's interesting you talk about the fact that, you know, I have a choice to be an activist, because of course I do. <laughs> I do have a choice to be an activist. Um, it sometimes and, doesn't feel that way though, does it? Well, uh, no, honestly, it does, you know, it does. Uh, but I think the, the thing is, is, you know, we're talking about our faith and, 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 you know, moving our minds and thinking about the future and believing and hope and I think love as well. Uh, I think a lot of the drive for me personally to be an activist actually comes from 
those that don't get to choose whether or not to be an activist. Um, and I think, you know, specifically, a lot of the work that uh, I've been really lucky to do has been with uh, 350 Pacific yeah. um, and a lot of the work that they've done. And I think for me, one of my most uh, moving experiences ever that I draw a lot of strength from still is when 350 Pacific, uh, there was a, a contingent of Pacific Islanders from about 14 Pacific Island nations that came to Australia with traditional canoes and blocked the coal port uh, the Newcastle coal port, which is the biggest coal port in the world about two years ago. Mm. And it was just, uh, for me, it was, I think, uh, you know, I do identify it not as a believer, but I think it was, for me, probably the closest I have come to a, you know, strong religious experience was watching just a giant coal, uh, coal ship. And I mean, I don't know if anyone in this room has seen a coal ship before, yeah. but they're really something. <laughs> it's really something. Yeah. And a giant coal ship come around the bend in the port at Newcastle to be stopped in its tracks by a, uh, by a canoe with about four people on it, flags flying mm. high, singing traditional songs. Mm. And I just thought, well, that's me done, you know? Like, <laughs> you know I've uh, just worked out what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, I think you know, there's, a, there's a lot in that stories and that belief and that hope uh, in the face of adversity. And, uh, and on that note, I've completely forgotten the question. <laughs> That's all right. Like, we are starting to get the round up. So the, the, the question was about what you've achieved as a, as a social movement that you, that you couldn't have, have, have done anyway, so any other way. So if we can just each take 30 seconds to, to what is it, what is the thing and, and how does it keep you going? Uh, I don't know what the thing is yet. That's the whole <laughs> point of the movement. Uh, you know, I kind of talked about it before, like, as I said, Right now, we know what we have to achieve to stop the Adani coal mine. Before, it was getting Westpac to rule out Adani. We worked out what we needed to do that, build a really powerful movement, put a lot of pressure on Westpac, and we won. We knew we needed to get Combank out of Adani. We thought, let's just do it all over again, and we won. And now we're up to the last big hurdle, which is moving both of our major parties in Australia to radically shift their stance on whether or not Australia should continue to mine coal. Mm. And at the moment, as I said earlier, there is no critical path. There is no clear pathway to victory apart from become so big and so annoying and so powerful mm. that something got to give. Uh, and so I have no idea uh, you know, what's going to come, but all Watch I know is that- Watch this space. That's right. Watch this <laughs> space. That's all I can say. Tim, very quickly from you. Yeah, look, I, it's for others to, to judge. For me, um, that sense of achievement is that I think I've tried to live consequentially with my faith. And it, the passion for justice came from faith, uh, that poverty is not natural, it's created. Mm. Those who wrote the rules, well, we can change those rules. Mm. And uh, if everyone's made and carries the image of God, whether they're disabled or in ancient times slaves, even today slaves, mm. they absolutely have the same rights as I do and my children do. Um, you know, some people say, is it really that? And I say sometimes tongue in cheek, the passion for justice may have also come from sharing a bedroom with my brother for 17 <laughs> years. Uh, we'd have our fights. Uh, if we wake up, my father, great dad, um, died last year at 97, he'd storm in. He'd always say the same thing. I don't care who started this fight. I don't want, want to know the story. I am not interested in who you think is to blame. I'm punishing you both. That's when I got interested in justice. <laughs> I ended up doing law because I thought it was about justice and I realised it was only about making money, so my journey's gone on from there. It's wonderful. Jared, what have you achieved through social movement that you couldn't have achieved in another forum? Yeah, I think I'm a totally different person um, in that uh, I'm going to use a, a word that is Christianese, but re repentance is actually centre, that um, uh, I'm involved in systems of, and it's wonderful that uh, Sash, incredible young leader, has just been nominated to the, the board, but I'm involved in systems of patriarchy, of homophobia, of white supremacy, that um, the reign of God that Tim was talking about earlier means that I'm saved from that. And my experience has been um, not, isn't it great that I'm taking part in these good things and I'm a good person, but I'm actually part of the problem. 
And uh, it's, you know, um, I, I like movements that are more like Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> than they are, you know, more hardcore self-righteous than thou. Like, um, I want to join Sinners Anonymous that I'm, I'm part of the problem. Like, the, and, like, even this week, <clears throat> getting messages from people on Manus thanking me for my work, and it's like, <laughs> what, what on earth? Like, um, the, the joy and the humility that flows out of joining these incredible people that there is a world beyond good guys and bad guys, um, that instead we can together build something that looks just and realise that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth that comes at the cost of the poor and the earth. The opposite of poverty is actually community, a community of healing justice. This is what Dr. King called the beloved community. And I think for us, that's the vision that these should be spaces of kindness and encouragement because the work that you do is difficult and hard and so often discouraging. And most of us just need a hug. <laughs> most of us need to be thanked for what this is doing. So if it doesn't happen later, I want to thank you for what you're doing. I want to call you back to that original reason that you got involved. I want to remind you of Lily, who we heard from earlier, and her incredible leadership and the privilege that it is to partner with incredible leaders like that um, and I'll finish with this that uh, one of the things that Uncle Vincent Harding said was um, Jared don't call it a privilege to benefit from other people's oppression that we must develop different languages because the real privilege is coming alongside those who are struggling and giving up all those things that come at the cost of their lives and by this wonderful grace we get to participate in it that's the kind of movement I want to be a part of Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, for me, I get um, an incredibly strong sense of community from being a part of a social movement. And uh, I grew up in a country town up on, uh, in northeast Victoria. Uh, and I currently live uh, half the time in another country town out in the Otways. Um, and I like country towns because I really like community. I get my sense of connection. I'm able to connect with my sense of self um, as well as with a sense of purpose and find inspiration in the connection to community that we have, which is incredibly lucky for me that my, um, I suppose my perception of, of where my power comes from is also from my connection to community. Mm. And, and that's what gives me a sense of my ability to create change. I don't think I, I've ever been able to find that or articulate that in any other way than, than through my connection with others. Um, the other sort of side of this, I guess, is the last six months I've been looking a lot at themes of and work around transition and resilience, which are going to be uh, much, much more important for us as we go forward in our work. And underpinning all of that work is collaboration, networks and communities. Yeah. And um, I know Bill McKibben has been asked, uh, in the face of climate change, where do you go? What's your escape plan? Um, mine's New Zealand, just um, <laughs> in case you're wondering. <laughs> Tasmania's got a lot of bushfires. Anyway, I have thought about this a lot. But Bill McKibben's uh, response <laughs> is, um, it, there's, no, there's no place. You don't escape yeah. this. What you go to is community. And that's what you need to find, and that's what we need to create. And so seeing our role in that, I think, is, is the key for us creating, sustaining social movements in the future. Thank you. That was a wonderful panel, all of you. Thank you so much. If the rest of you could join in thanking the panelists. Sarah, uh, Tim, Jared, Victoria and Isaac, uh, thank you for a very powerful and inspiring uh, series of uh, from the heart presentations from each of you, which I think take everyone in this room back to why they're in this game in the first place. It's because it is uh, a matter of the heart. Uh, I'd like to, on behalf of ACTIG, present with some small gifts, Kate, uh, give them. and. Um, 
Thank you again. Another round of applause for a brilliant opening panel this afternoon. Um, I'd now like to invite all of you to come for afternoon tea, which will be in the exhibition hall, which is actually down to the right end of the foyer. So it's not in the entrance foyer where we had lunch. It's down the right end, uh, down uh, with our sponsors. And at 3.15 sharp, we're inviting you to move to the concurrent sessions. And those sessions are in your conference app or in the program. Uh, there's no registration required, but if you go into a room and it's absolutely chockers, uh, uh, make everyone comfortable with just going into the next, your next favourite session that looks interesting, uh, so it doesn't get too crowded. Uh, the room's set about 50 each, and they will start at 3.15 sharp, so grab your cup of tea and your, your um, sweetie treaty and uh, go up to the, the sessions. And please do go and have a look and talk to our sponsors this afternoon. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you um, back in plenary uh, after the concurrent sessions.